Every single day in Britain, somebody, somewhere, unearths treasure. And when I turned it over, I saw this gold colour and the royal crest of arms on it. It came out of the ground shining, bright, shiny gold. Objects left behind by our ancestors that tell the story of our country and how we once lived. These are Britain's secret treasures. British Museum, the world's treasure house. Inside this wonderful old building are some of the most remarkable objects that mankind has ever created. But not all of these objects have been found by archaeologists. Many of them have been discovered by you, the great British public, in fields and rivers and gardens up and down the country and then logged with the museum. I've joined a panel of experts to sift through nearly a million of your amazing finds and help select 50 of the greatest treasures unearthed by the public. Amazing. And all yeah. just a few feet or even a few inches beneath our feet. From gold and silver worth thousands of pounds. 33,000. To everyday objects made precious by the stories that they tell. Across the week, we'll be counting down the top 50 finds of recent years. Tonight, a gold pendant with a remarkable secret. That's amazing. A war medal reveals the hero behind it. The British were outnumbered five to one. And an ancient toy that gives us a window onto an 18th century childhood. But first, at number 50, our panel of experts has chosen an item that reveals a dark side to our ancient past. Journalist John McCarthy has gone to Winchester to find out more. It may come as a surprise that an item on a programme about Britain's greatest treasures isn't silver or gold or anything bling, but this, a slave shackle. It's part of a pair that once chained someone's feet together. This thing really affects me because I know how devastating it is to lose your freedom. He was on his way to the airport when gunmen dragged him from his taxi. Today, John McCarthy became the latest victim. Back in 1986, I was working as a journalist in Warthol, Lebanon, when I was kidnapped by a militant group calling themselves Islamic Jihad. They held me captive for five years, and for most of that time, I was chained up like an animal. The weight of the chain pulling on my ankle, a constant reminder that my life was in their hands, that at any moment my captors might kill me. And that's why this gruesome thing fascinates me. I want to know more about who might have worn it, and of course, why and when. The Roman Empire was built on the back of slavery, and this 2,000-year-old slave shackle is rare evidence that it occurred in Britain. It was found by landscape gardener Jeremy de Montfalcon, near to the old Roman road that runs between Winchester and Silchester, which I'm currently driving along. It's the location of the find which may provide a clue as to why this ancient Britain was enslaved. Maybe our slave was marched along it, but towards what fate? Incredibly, Silchester still has the remains of a Roman amphitheatre, and that's where I'm heading next. This is my first visit to an amphitheatre in Britain. Oh, wow! It's way bigger than I thought it would be. Silchester Amphitheatre was the O2 arena of its time, where thousands of people gathered for big events. I'm meeting Dr John Pierce, an expert in all things Roman. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And what an amazing place this is. Yes, it's always a real surprise when you get here. The scale of the, of the place is really unexpected. I'm not sure how my little slave shackle fits into the scene here. If what happens here is like what happens in Italy, then the gladiators are the culminating part of the day and you have the lead-up to that, and what is commonly part of the lead-up is public execution. Would these people be beheaded? Would people, people would be beheaded, or they would be quite often be mauled to death by, by wild animals let loose. 
The shackle found by the Roman road could have been worn by a slave who was brought here, probably to their death. So my slave, who's may have walked from Silchester wearing this, this horrible thing, could have been brought into the arena, come in here surrounded by thousands of people, and then hearing the animals roaring. Everybody baying for blood. And then they'd stand here and maybe what wolves or bears would be released would in. Would be released into the, into the arena. And nowhere to run. No. Utterly horrific. It's amazing to think that some 2,000 years ago, a man or a woman was chained up using this shackle and probably going through many of the same emotions that I experienced in Lebanon. I think it's very important that this is on the list of Britain's greatest treasures. It's a chilling reminder of just how precious our freedom is and how easily it can be taken away by others. Next up at number 49, a little boy who couldn't believe his luck when he struck gold. Meet five-year-old James Hyatt. He was playing with his father's metal detector in an Essex field when something rather exciting happened. What happened? Did you hear it making a funny noise? Yeah. What did it do? It goes beep, 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 beep. And then you know there's some, something special under the ground. And I dig it up and there's something there. And what was it? Uh, gold. Real gold? It's amazing, James. It's a good thing you found it, isn't it? What James had found was exceptional. A treasure from around the time of King Henry VIII. I want to take a look for myself. It's a very, very beautiful thing. This pendant was actually made as a reliquary, um, somewhere where a holy relic would be stored. Back in Henry VIII's day, holy relics were the ultimate lucky charms. People treasured bits of hair, bone or clothes that they believed once belonged to saints, convinced they warded off evil. So what relic is in the Hockley pendant? This back panel actually opens up and the British Museum has said I can have a look inside. Well, wow, that is interesting. It looks to me as if it's just earth, it's just mud. It's a bit of a mystery. What relic could this be? I want to find out, so I'm meeting James Robinson, a man who knows all about the relic world. Before he tells me what's in little James's pendant, he's got some other strange examples to show me. In these boxes were believed to be the remains and body parts of some very holy people. Have these all got relics inside them? They don't all have relics in them, but they're all made to contain relics. So, for instance, up here, um, there's um, the relic of, of the shin bone of Mary Magdalene. But the most sensational is, is the breast milk of the Virgin Mary, um, which is in this Golly. compartment here. Yes. Um, which is, is so incredible. It is incredible. You know? What about my little Hockley pendant here? What, what does this tell you? It's very difficult to be certain, but you could imagine from what's represented on the outside that it was actually made to contain a relic of the True Cross. That's amazing. So this thing has lain forgotten in the earth for centuries. A little boy finds it and potentially it's got a little chip of, of Christ's cross in it. It's an incredible survival. It really is. Right now, the Hockley pendant is stored safely here at the British Museum. But the South End Museum in Essex wants to raise the money to buy it. And that money will be split between the landowner and the finder. So, whether or not it brought any luck to its original owner, it will almost certainly guarantee a little something for James's future. One extremely happy little boy. While that pendant was about godliness, our next item is all about partying. In September 1662, a king's horse lost the decorative brass from its harness. It was found nearly 350 years later in Epsom by a local journalist, Mark Davison. We sent archaeologist Helen Geek to meet him. So how did you actually find it? I got a large signal which sounded like a drinks can. I thought, oh, it's an old ashtray, just a few decades old. 
And when I turned it over, I saw this gold colour and then a royal crest of arms on it. So what did it look like when it was cleaned up? Wonderful, isn't it? Wow. Wow, I've never seen anything quite Very like impressive. that. impressive. Yeah. But this is no ordinary horse ornament. This horse brass bears the crest of Charles II, who was King of England 350 years ago. We know Charles visited the place in Epsom where Mark found the horse brass. He went there for a party. The date, September the 1st, 1662, recorded by prolific diarist of the time, John Evelyn. But what was the party an aid of? To discover the answer, we need to go back a few years to when Charles's father, the first King Charles, was brought here to Whitehall in central London. In January 1649, Charles I came to this precise spot in London where with one stroke of the executioner's axe, he was beheaded. And that act of regicide really shocked the country because for the first time, there was no royal head of state, quite literally. Young Charles fled to Europe and commoner Oliver Cromwell took over as ruler. Cromwell was a major killjoy, a party pooper, who even tried to ban Christmas. When he died in 1658, the public decided they'd had enough of Cromwell's austerity programme. They wanted fun back in their lives, and who better to lead them than Charles II, the king of parties? So a bunch of aristocrats, including the Earl of Berkeley, owner of the estate where the horse brass was found, went to Europe to invite Charles back. Within a year, Charles II was crowned king here at Westminster Abbey, and that's why he went to the Earl of Berkeley's party in 1662. He wanted to publicly favour the Earl. And while he was at it, he just happened to lose a horse brass. And that's why this item, which is on long-term loan to Surrey's Bourne Hall Museum, is so exceptional. It's a portal to a precise day and party in the life of the man who brought fun back to Britain. Coming up, an exquisite gold necklace, a tiny 18th century toy that packs a big punch, and a World War I medal that reveals a hero's story. We're counting down the top 50 objects found by the British public. Extraordinary, often unique finds that have changed the way that we view our past. And you can get involved too. This week we're looking for new treasures found by the public. So if you think you found something the British Museum might want to have a look at, then go to itv.com forward slash treasure and on Sunday night we're going to be revealing the best new items. Indeed, and this next find by 47-year-old Taunton policeman Kevin Neal in a field in Somerset provides a rare glimpse of how child's play was different 300 years ago. Military historian Saul David investigates. When I was a boy, I used to love playing with toy soldiers, and these are some of the actual ones. My soldiers would spend hours trying to defeat the baddies, and if I'm honest, it was probably because of playing with these soldiers that meant that I was bound to end up as a military historian. Back in the 1700s, Britain was one of the world's superpowers and was constantly fighting wars. Children copied the grown-ups, most using sticks for guns. But if you were very rich, you could have had one of these. Wow, now that's definitely not for sale in this shop and it's an absolutely glorious example of a miniature cannon. This tiny, tiny cannon is old and delicate, but apparently would actually have been able to fire real miniature cannonballs. I think little boys would have had a lot of fun with this 300 years ago, so I've asked a military friend to make me a replica so I can have a go. Oh, wow, look at that. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Could you make something like that? Um, I'm used to doing stuff a bit bigger, um, <laughs> but um, theoretically the, the skills should be the same. Simon is making my cannon in exactly the same way as our 300-year-old toy would have been made, by pouring molten bronze into a mould. I think it's time to break open the mould to see what we've got. And there you are. <laughs> Brilliant. Look at that. Tiny bronze cannon. Brilliant. Now, in true schoolboy style, we're going to try and fire the cannon at a water-filled balloon. Just about the load. Um, is that the target? Yeah, let's put it over here. All it takes is a little bit of gunpowder and a tiny cannonball. <laughs> Fantastic. 
I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that. <laughs> I can see why this little cannon is on the list, because it really is a dangerous beast. You've got to ask the question, what were our ancestors thinking? I wouldn't let my children play with a lethal object like this. The British Museum holds many of the finest pieces of jewellery ever crafted in Britain. And this necklace, it's known as the Sedgeford Talk, is one of the best. It's on the list because oh, it's an exquisite and rare piece by the Iceni tribe, whose leader back in 60 AD was none other than the flame-haired Queen Boudicca, or Boadicea as we used to call her. But there's also an extraordinary story behind the discovery of the two sections of the necklace. This main part was unearthed by a farmer called A.E. Middleton back in 1965 with his tractor. But the end section wasn't discovered until 40 years later by Dr. Steve Hammond on an archaeological dig in the same field. This end section has been valued at £65,000. It's been acquired by the British Museum, and now both parts of the necklace are on show in the museum's Iron Age gallery. The Sedgeford necklace is the hero of its very own reunion story, as is our next find, item number 45. Only in this case, the finder went in search of its original owner. In 2009, 56-year-old Manuel Nicdeo, a data processor from Slough, found in a Surrey field a distinguished conduct medal, second only to the Victoria Cross, awarded for exceptional bravery, and on it was engraved the name George Humber. When I found out that uh, it was a medal, and a very important medal on top of that, I just want to give it to the, uh, to the rightful owner. I want to, I want to give it back to them. A local newspaper picked up the story, and a relative of George Humber contacted the paper. George had passed away, but Manuel was able to give the medal back to George's grandson, Mark. Anita Rani has her own reason for investigating this medal. George got his medal for bravery during World War I. They said it was to be the war to end all wars, but as we know, there was another only 30 years later, World War II. It was during this time that my own grandpa fought with the British Army, but sadly, I never even had the opportunity to meet him. So I can really appreciate just how precious this is. I'm going to meet this hero's grandson, Mark Humber. Apparently, the medal's loss is down to a love story. So your granny was a hot picker. Your granddad went to Surrey with his mate. Somehow the medal ends up when they're going for a walk in the country in this cult. Well, they were courting. Romance. Young love, in, Mark. Indeed. George must have dropped the medal while courting his fiancée. This modest man never told his grandson of his wartime bravery. How much would it mean to you to find out about it, your granddad? It would mean everything, from, from being a small boy and hearing a few stories set on his knee to think, well, this is actually where it happened, this is what he was doing, it would just be amazing. I soon found out that unusually, George was awarded his medal for continuous gallantry. That means for a number of brave actions throughout the war, not just one. However, it was his actions during 1918's Battle of Lys that I think were the greatest examples of his bravery. So I've taken Mark to Nerva Glees in Belgium, a few miles northeast of the large town of Hazebrook. This is the exact spot where his grandfather set up his gun in April. 1918. They were here to defend Hazebrook's vital railway line, which supplied British troops at the front. So your, your granddad's battalion were based here to just generally protect this area. Out of the blue, this area was attacked by German troops. And not just a few German troops. The British were outnumbered five to one. Blimey. As the Germans pushed towards the railway line, they penned George's D battery into a part of the field known as Crucifix Corner and launched a lethal attack. 20 men were wounded. 11 men were killed, including a commanding officer.
So your grandfather's mates. Yeah. His commanding officer, the guys that he would have played cards with, the guys that he would have fought through the Somme with. Mm, that's very, <laughs> that's, that's very close to home, you know, right next year for that to happen. With his officer dead, Sergeant George Humber was now in charge, commanding his men to stand their ground and keep the Germans at bay. They kept this spirited defence up for days. But they fought them off. They yeah. kept at it. Mm -hmm. And they prevented the Germans from actually getting to Hazelbrook. Just to think of being a little old man when I was a kid, to think he was here doing that all that time ago. It's amazing. Do you feel proud of him? <laughs> yeah, incredibly proud of him. I'm, I'm welling up. Um, it's, I've almost like been able to reach out, you know, and, and, and touch him, talk to him again. It's fantastic that Manuel found it and subsequently got it back to me. Yeah, super. This medal, hard won and extremely rare, deserves its place as number 45 on the list of Britain's secret treasures. That's it for today, but the countdown of treasures continues tomorrow. A cufflink is an early royal souvenir. Buried pirate treasure turns up in Lincolnshire and a 2,000-year-old comb reveals the secrets of Bronze Age style. Yes, the countdown continues tomorrow, but in the meantime, check out itv.com slash treasure for more details on how you can send in your find, and it may end up in the special live show on Sunday. So it's goodbye, Carla and Peter, all very emotional next in Coronation Street, and then huge emotion undoubtedly in Superstar. It's the first elimination at nine. <laughs>